All right, guys, today I'm going to show you an easy way to make tacos de chicharron, which is kind of a perfect example of the kinds of foods that I'm thinking about for the emergence diet. I went back on the fourth on the name of what we should call this diet. I think the emergence diet is the best name. I've got a couple old videos called the emergence diet, but this is just sort of the evolution of that concept. The basic idea is, of course, to create a diet that can help you escape your torpid metabolism, which is what hibernating animals do in the spring. They emerge from hibernation. And so what I've been experimenting with lately is changing the source of the proteins from skeletal muscles and grains to protein sources that are more based on collagen and gelatin. And this is a classic Mexican recipe, tacos de chicharron. And all I did in this recipe is I just tweaked a couple of things. We're gonna use Epic brand low fat pork rinds. One of the ideas of this diet is to maximize insulin signaling. Obese humans are not good at burning glucose. So one of the ideas of this diet is to get insulin signaling working again. And so that's why this diet is starch based rather than using a lot of fat. But the huge thing about this recipe is changing over the source of protein from grains and skeletal muscle to collagen and gelatin. I tweeted this week, it has been known since 1969 that obese humans have high circulating branch chain amino acids. That's uh, valine, leucine, and isoleucine, and low circulating glycine. That is why when I go to the Asian store, I always grab some pig's feet. Right now, I have beef tendon. This is out of that 1969 paper, and you can see uh, glycine is 214 in lean adults, and it's all the way down to 170 in obese adults. Um, valine is 211 in lean and goes up to almost 260 in obesity, and the other two... Uh, branch chain amino acids, those are all the three in yellow, are also increased in obesity. And I pointed out that if you took 100 grams of meat picked from cooked pig's feet, right? You And this is compared to uh, the same weight of 80% lean ground beef. Um, so the pig's feet has 12 grams of fat, the ground beef has 16. The pig's feet have less than a half gram of isoleucine. And isoleucine in some of the rodent studies at least, seems like a particularly bad actor out of the branched chain amino acids if you're insulin resistant. Um, and you can see that level is 1.2 grams in the beef, so that's about about four times as much in the same weight of beef. And glycine is 1.2 in the ground beef, but it's all the way up to three and a half in the pig's feet. And so pig's feet has a 10 to 1 ratio of glycine to isoleucine. Ground beef has a 1 to 1 ratio of glycine to isoleucine. And I said at the bottom, this is interesting because of this paper, and I've talked about this paper before, but quickly, what happens is that for some reason, the branched chain amino acids drive down glycine levels in skeletal muscle. So the reason that in obesity, you can't burn glucose is because your mitochondria are overloaded with fuel and that fuel is in the form of acetyl-CoA. And so in this graph, this is the amount of acetyl-CoA in skeletal muscle. And this very tall bar is Zucker fatty rats. Uh, this is a type of rat with genetic obesity. But if you restrict branch chain amino acids, the, um, the amount of acetyl groups in their skeletal muscle drops. And why does it drop? Because what the glycine does is it binds to these acetyl groups and you actually eliminate them in your urine. So what's happening is the glycine is transporting the extra fuel out of your mitochondria and you simply eliminate it in the urine and that allows you to burn glucose again. So this is in rodents again. They put the rodents on a high fat diet for four weeks and then at this four week mark, this group whose weight flattens out, they were supplemented with collagen and this group that continued to get fat stayed on that high fat diet. The blood glucose of the mice on the collagen supplemented diet is much lower after a glucose challenge and collagen and gelatin and connective tissues are all very high in glycine. And so you can see that either restricting branch chain amino acids or increasing glycine can both help with insulin sensitivity and they can both help with weight loss. And by switching from skeletal muscle to connective tissues. You're doing both things. In this recipe, I'm going to make the tortillas. That's the single hardest part of the recipe. I haven't found a brand of tortilla on the market that really meets the specifications that I want of being very low branch chain amino acid and low in fat. And so you'll see they're not that hard to make, but I, I brought this up because this is the taco to chicharron with my handmade tortillas. And this is the taco to chicharron if you were to just buy commercial corn tortillas. 
And the corn has quite a bit of polyunsaturated fat, so uh, that really increases the amount of polyunsaturated fat in the recipe. But the branch chain amino acids in my recipe, and this is for the whole meal, so those 4.2 are mostly coming from the pork rinds that, that we're going to use. The corn tortillas nearly double the amount of branch chain amino acids. This is still not a ton of BCAAs and you might get away with this just fine, but for the purpose of this video, I wanted to show the sort of purest form of the recipe. So here's the recipe. This Fjord Glut flour is a gluten-free flour. It's made of wheat starch, so if you make tortillas with it, they kind of taste like actual flour tortillas. Uh, they come out a little bit chewy if you just use the flour and water. And so I'm adding a little bit of gelatin and butter to the tortillas, as you'll see. And we're gonna use the Epic brand uh, baked pork rinds. They're very good. And because they're baked, they don't have any seed oils in them. They don't have a bunch of high poofa lard in them. So here I've got my mise en place laid out. You can see that is one cup of the Fjord gut flour. That's about 150 grams. And I'm weighing out the water because I want to get 150 grams of water for this. If you get the right water to flour ratio, it really helps the consistency. You can see I'm adding that scoop of gelatin. That's a tablespoon. That's about 10 grams of gelatin. And we're just going to whisk that into the water and it'll make a kind of a, uh, the, the gelatin takes a while to absorb the water and it kind of thickens the water. It makes like a, almost like an egg white type consistency. All right. So we're adding the 150 grams of flour. We're just going to add a dash of salt. Okay, so here we are adding the water and the gelatin. You can see that it's thickened up. And I melted uh, just a sliver of butter in the microwave. So that's uh, probably three grams of butter, something like that. And again, the gelatin and the butter go in this to, to kind of break up the chewiness of the gluten-free flour. And this doesn't take a whole lot of mixing. Um, there's no gluten in this, so you, it's not like a traditional wheat flour where you knead it and, and develop the gluten. This is just a quick uh, mix it up. Comes out a little bit sticky compared to maybe a bread dough, but that's okay. We can fix that with a little bit more of the flour, as you'll see. And there I'm just adding a pinch more flour uh, and I'm going to kind of leave it on the outside so that it's easier to handle and easier to roll. Okay, so now we're rolling. And once you've done this a couple times, it's actually really easy. This goes very quickly. Uh, you can see I'm just putting some of the flour on the board there. I'm grabbing a ball of the dough. Uh, well, you can see we smash that out pretty easily. Uh, flip it over to get the flour on both sides. And we roll it out. Mine always come out a little bit square uh, rather than round. If Elizabeth was here, she would hate that, but she's not here, so it's okay. Okay, so I've preheated this nonstick skillet. This is a ceramic coated skillet. It's very nonstick. It's nice for working with things like this. Uh, it goes over two burners, so you can add three tortillas at a time. I decided to invest in a good griddle when I did this diet because I knew I'd be making a lot of pancakes and tortillas, and this certainly accelerates things. You can see they're starting to steam. They've now been cooking for about a minute and a half. You can see there's a bit of color on that side that was cooking so now they've gone about another 45 seconds and i'm gonna flip them back to the first side look how nice they look it's not that hard another 30 seconds on the first side or so is all that they need so now it's time to make the actual chicharron we've got our herdes salsa verde you can see i've got that pan really preheated so that when that goes into the pot, it immediately starts boiling down. This is how you make a Mexican sauce. They're typically fried. Often they put fat in the pan and they'll add it to the very hot fat and it thickens the sauce. You know, that, that green salsa when it comes out of the can is kind of liquidy. So you're going to boil off a lot of that liquid. Okay, 
the color will get darker and the sauce will thicken. At this point, you can see it's pretty thick. We've got there our epic baked pork rinds and we're gonna add those. I didn't mean to really add the entire bag. I was I usually use maybe a little over half the bag, but um, that's okay. And we're just tossing those in the green sauce. In Mexico, what they do is they cover the pot and they let it simmer for about five minutes and the pork rinds or the chicharron get soft. Uh, I like them crunchy. So I will then take them and put them immediately onto one of those tacos. I put a little bit of light sour cream on the taco first. Here we have the taco with the sour cream and we're gonna load that up with chicharron and that is the whole deal. Enjoy.